Hi, my name is Mark Goodner. Uh, I'm a program manager on the C++ team here at Microsoft. And I'm here to talk to you about what we're doing in Visual Studio around uh, C++ support for Linux. Um, so we'll go ahead and dive in. So wordy slide, but basically uh, we had an extension that we introduced in Visual Studio 2015. In Visual Studio 2017, we've actually brought this capability inbox into Visual Studio. Um, so as part of the install experience, if you scroll down to the bottom and other workloads, you'll find this picture here for Linux development with C++. If you select that, then we'll put everything on your box that you need to do C++ development on Windows in Visual Studio. Um, so what you're going to be able to do with that is you're going to be able to use our full C, C++ tool set, you know, all the capabilities we have in Visual Studio for C and C++ you'll be able to use with your Linux applications. Um, so we've also got support for things like attached to process. So if you've got a machine that's running a Linux application that you need to debug, you can actually attach to a process with Visual Studio and actually debug that and figure out what's going on. Um, there's no restrictions on Linux distribution. You can use any Linux distribution you want. Uh, basically, all we need is SSH in order to talk to the machine. Uh, we need GDB server or GDB on the machine so that we can actually hit it to debug. And today, we are doing compilation on the remote Linux machine, so you'll need a compiler. Um, and today, what we have is, and I'll, I'll pop out the project properties here in a second, but our, the project system that we have in Visual Studio for Linux C++ is geared towards GCC. Um, so we're emitting the flags and stuff for GCC through our project system. Uh, a lot of that you can override and use Clang if you want to, um, but if you run into any flags that Clang doesn't understand, then it's not going to work. We don't have Clang-specific support yet. Um, out of the box, we've got IntelliSense that's provided for uh, GCC and standard libc++. You can bring in your own headers from your box and get IntelliSense specific to your projects. Um, and as I was mentioning, we have our own project system that works kind of interestingly. What we're doing is we're actually connecting to the remote Linux machine and we're actually driving the compile and link steps by running MS build on our project system on the Windows machine and then emitting on the remote machine. We copy the files over there and then we actually emit the commands to run on the remote to compile and link them there. Um, understandably, a lot of people already have existing code bases. We've got a makefile project system as well within Visual Studio. It's not a traditional Linux makefile, but what you can do with that is you can load your sources into it and then you can run whatever build step you need on the remote from that project. And I've actually got some, I've got some scripts I posted on GitHub that let you point at a directory and pull in all the files from that directory so you can populate one of those projects. I don't think it's uh, production ready, but at least you can see how to generate those projects from that source code and generate and you know use it for your own purposes. Uh, and that link right there, aka.ms/vslinux, that's our kind of introductory post that covers everything in full detail about this workload. Um, so this is a short talk, so we're just going to flip right into demos. And so what I will do is I will start by showing you what it looks to create a new project with this. Oh, well, I thought I was. Let's minimize that. Ah. All right, there we go. So here's our, this is the project types that we have that come out of the box. We've got four project types we give you. Uh, the first one is Blink, which gives you a sample that shows how to write a Blink application for a Raspberry Pi. There's a little bit of documentation in there on how to set that up. But basically, that one's there to just show you conceptually that we're able to work with ARM development boards. Uh, today, we work with ARM development boards that can actually run a compiler. Obviously, there's some smaller stuff that can't. Um, the console application is essentially, you know, uh, Hello World. And then we've got Empty Project, which is... Basically, these three are the same type in terms of the capabilities that they offer you. And then the last one is the makefile project that I told you about. So we'll go ahead and create this one. We'll let that come up. And today, I'm not going to be using the, and we've got some documentation here that shows you kind of the, an overview of the system. Um, and there, we're just going to print F out. But today, I'm not going to use a VM or a remote machine. I'm going to use the Windows subsystem for Linux. So basically, 
I'm going to treat this as though it's a remote Linux machine. So I've got SSH running here, and I've got my compilers and everything set up. So the Windows subsystem for Linux, if you're not familiar with it, is in Windows 10. It basically brings an entire Linux subsystem in. It's not a VM. They actually have uh, implemented um, things that pipe down into the Linux kernel so that this distribution is actually calling down into the Linux kernel. So it's much more performant than running you know, in a VM or something. Uh, but this is what I'm going to be talking to. And we can see here, we have a connection manager that helps you manage your connections to your Linux machines. So it's under, it's under Tools Options under Cross-Platform Connection Manager. And so here you can see I've already set this up, but if you add another one, what you can do is give it your host name, the port SSH is on, user, pass, and we do support private key, including with passphrase if you need that to connect to your remote. We do support logging in with root if you need to log into your remote system with root. Uh, obviously, it's not very recommended, but in some cases, it's necessary for embedded systems development if that's the sort of thing that you're doing. So we do support that. And so now I can go ahead and hit my local host. It does, it, and now it's going to copy my files over, and it's copying them into the Linux subsystem. So if we go over here and tape, check this out. Oh, it should be in projects. Oh, interesting. What did I do? Um, oh, I see. Yeah. And so here you can see my console application is in there that got created. And now I've hit my breakpoint. And I don't have it open, but we actually can see what our output looks like by going to a Linux console. And so from this window, if I get down into a better place, then if I step over this code, function keys on this aren't the greatest. But so you can see the output from the app comes back into the console window there. Um, so this is a pretty basic example of what you can do with this stuff. I've got something a little bit more interesting. So one of the reasons you might be doing this, why you would want to use this capability in Visual Studio, of course, might be just to work on your Linux applications and just to use the capabilities of Visual Studio. But another reason is for cross-platform code, right? Um, so this is an example, an OpenGL demo that I've got here. And so I've got one, one source file. I've got this main CPP here. And now I've got a Windows project and I've got a Linux project. Neither one of these projects has any uh, code in them. They're basically... If we look at the add references, what you can see is both of these projects reference this cross-plat cube solution. And this cross-plat cube solution is what's called a shared items uh, project. We just lit this up in Visual Studio 15.2. We had some compatibility issues with our Linux stuff prior to that. Uh, but 15.2 went to RTM today. Um, so if you go get that, then you'll be able to use the shared items projects with the Linux projects as well. And so now I've got this set with my startup project to the Windows project. So what that does, it fires up the spinning cube there, as you'd expect. But if I set the Linux one to run, and again, this is running, and I guess I should say this is not supported. I'm actually running, you see down here in the bottom, I'm running an X server on Windows. And so I'm actually going to run this in WSL. WSL is not for this scenario. Um, so I'm kind of having a little bit of fun here, but I'll show you the project property. So you can see here's my, the host that I'm running on. If I had multiple hosts, then I could point to, to other ones here. Uh, but you can see I can set where my remote root build directory is, uh, what the project output directory structure I want is. Under debugging, I've got some options here that I can use GDB server. And you can see here, here's my export display in order to hit that. And right now, uh, I've got, this is also new in 15.2. We've added support for Python pretty printing. And we've also added support for STL NatViz visualization, or I'm sorry, not STL, for NatViz visualization within Visual Studio. So we've got much better type visualizations in when we're debugging. Um, so I'll go ahead and show you what that looks like. Otherwise, the other things that are of note here, I get my IntelliSense by pointing to a local folder of my includes, and that's how I get more IntelliSense than what's out of the box. Um, and then otherwise, if we come here and look at all options, you can see all of the options that I'm piping in through to for this application. And then under the linker, and you can see here's the OpenGL libraries that I'm passing as part of the linker. 
And another thing to call out is we've actually got remote pre-build and post-build steps that you can use on the Linux side if you need. So the, the project system basically lights up all these capabilities to control things on the remote machine that you're connecting to. And so I'll go ahead and run this now. And you'll see that what I've got is driver issues. Uh, so it's the same, it's the same OpenGL app running. I'm not sure. This has worked in the past, but on this particular machine, uh, whatever's going on with the X server, I'm not getting the proper colors, but it's the same OpenGL app. It's the same code just compiled on the Linux machine and running here in WSL. And you can see I can also hit breakpoints um, if I make enough room to see what I'm doing. And we'll scroll down here. And this is to kind of highlight some of the changes we made for the debugger visualizations. So when you come in and you hit a breakpoint here, and hopefully you can see this. Um, if I expand the four range here, this is what things used to look like right here for our debugging. Um, when you had STL types in particular, you had this kind of nastiness where you know you had to really drill down deep in there before you could get to see what the actual data was in these structure in these STL structures. Uh, but if I look here, this is visualized view here. What that is, that is the um, at the NatViz visualization that we're providing out of the box. And so out of the box, we're doing that for basically the standard library. And so you can see here, it's a much nicer visualization where I can actually get my array and see how many things are actually in there and get right down to my data. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop this and just show you what the Python pretty print looks like. Because the thing about Python pretty printers, Python pretty printers don't work with GDB server. So I have to switch over to GDB mode. Um, when we run in GDB server mode, we actually have a cross-platform GDB client that comes as part of this workload that runs on your Windows box that then talks to the GDB server. So that's, that's generally great. Um, and it works especially if you're talking to you know, smaller devices that for some reason you can't run GDB on. But sometimes you run into situations where uh, perhaps it's either it used to be that it was just older versions of Linux that we would have problems talking to this way. Uh, now we're running into problems where it's also sometimes newer versions of Linux. But in those cases, what we can do is switch over to GD GDB mode. And the Python pretty printers don't work with GDB server, but they do work with GDB mode. So I'll do that and run the same application again. And we'll just go right into the debugger. And we'll find out I've got a bug. Um, I installed a new build this morning. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. Um, but the Python pretty printers basically give you a very similar view to the NatViz view that you had there. And the big advantage to the Python pretty printers over the NatViz view is that the NatViz, we provide out of the box for the standard STL types. Um, you, will, you may find that you'll get more type support on your Linux box with pretty printers that are supplied by other people that come out of the box. Um, and I've got a post up that went up today about that. And it looks like we're running actually fairly good on time, so I'm going to try and show you one more quick demo here. This is a demo showing a C++ Linux service that's going to run in WSL with an ASP.NET Core app running on Windows that's going to call that C++ service. Uh, so if I go ahead and start this guy up. And so the reason you might, and I had wanted to get this all the way to containers, but I didn't quite get this containerized. But the idea here is that you could scale up your C++ backend and run it maybe on something heavier, right? Uh, because it may be doing some OpenCV processing or something along those lines that you need um, more performance out of it than you're going to get from your website. Um, so. What do we want a Linux system to do? Well, first off, we can come in here, and we should have hit a breakpoint. It's hard to see at this resolution, and it's hard to grab with the trackpad. But basically, what I've done here is I've hit a breakpoint in my ASP.NET code. So you can see that the call that's going out to the C++ service, I can actually inspect you know, what's going on here. And you can see what I'm actually piping to this Linux service. So maybe you can imagine what I'm actually going to do here with this Linux service that's running on the Windows subsystem for Linux. If I continue, so now we're actually, we're at, what this service does is it pipes whatever command I give it, and it echoes the output of that command and renders it back in the web page. And I must have forgotten to hit my breakpoint in the Linux service. Um, 
I thought I had a break point there, but I don't seem to have hit it. Oops. Let's try Fortune. Maybe a little bit more dangerous. So we got that one. Yeah, it looks like I'm having an issue today with, uh, with my demos, which is great. But anyway, so you get the idea of what, what sort of capabilities we've got here. Um, and I don't have time to get into this uh, with this particular demo, but one of the cool things here as well is ASP.NET Core is cross-platform. So you could actually publish this ASP.NET Core website and actually run this on a Linux machine as well. It's not limited to Windows. Um, so that's what we've got there. So go back here. So that's what I've got in the way of demos. We've got some other sessions where we're going to be talking about um, some of our C++ capabilities with Linux. This afternoon at 5 p.m. is the first session. That's going to cover more than just Linux. It's also going to cover um, kind of what you can do with C++, especially in terms of um, moving your C++ code into VS 2017 and why you would want to do that. And there will be some Linux demos as part of that. And one thing that's really interesting about the demo that you'll get to see at that session is everything I talked about here was talking about um, the support that we have for Linux in our project system. But you probably have other things that you're using, like maybe CMake. So we are going to be adding CMake support for Linux C++ code as well. And we've got a demo that will be at that first session at 5 p.m. today showing builds. So we can actually build from a, from a CMake list.txt on a remote Linux machine and actually select our targets and build different things there. So we're expecting... Uh, that is not in preview yet. Those are very hot bits that just landed. Um, so that, that should be in one of the upcoming previews of 15.3, and it'll be on our blog when that's available. Um, so definitely check that out, and hopefully that's useful. And then we've got some other demos in the futures of Visual Studio Talk. At our Visual C++ booth, we're way back in the corner over by Tech Talk B, I think it is. Uh, and I'll be there most of today and should be there part of tomorrow if you want to talk about specifics of the sort of stuff that you're doing with Linux. And the one other thing that I'll add in terms of futures that we're doing around this workload, we're looking at um, doing some more around cross-compilation. We're very interested in cross-compile scenarios. Um, and we're looking at cross-compile not just from the perspective of building for Linux on Windows. We're also looking at taking this work that we've done to run GCC and running arbitrary GCC stuff on Windows, particularly for ARM MCU development. Um, so I don't have a, a time frame for when we're going to have that in preview, but that's something that's actually moving into active development right now. So if those are scenarios you're interested in, I'd be very interested in talking to you as well. So. To kind of wrap up here, to learn more, that's the URL where you can find out more about this. Uh, we've got a C++ survey. If you hit that URL and take our survey, uh, we've got t-shirts in the booth as long as we've got them for people who take the survey. Um, so we'd love to hear from you guys. Um, hearing from you guys really helps us figure out you know, what's important and what we need to do next. Uh, this workload is under active development. So we're really looking to hear from customers about how you're using it. Because if there's one thing I'm sure of, I have no idea what people are using this for. Um, I, I'm talking to people who are using this for everything from device development you know, to server development. And they may be doing cloud stuff. They may be doing high compute workloads for either engineering or finance. Or they may be running an ERP system that's 30 years old. Um, so it kind of crosses the gamut. So I'd love to hear from you guys about what you're interested in using this for. Or if you have used it, I'd love to get feedback on it from you. And so I think with that, I think I'm, I'm done. All right. Thanks, guys.